Uh, hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good evening to those uh, you know who are joining us from Europe, UK, and India, and uh, for uh, our friends from North America and uh, Canada. Good morning. Um, uh, my name is Vasudevan Swaminathan. I am the principal and uh, uh, president at uh, Zuchi Systems. Um, uh, we are uh, based out of uh, Chennai, India, and in Chicago. Um, I welcome you all to the first episode of Surarai Portal, a new series of quarterly sessions that we are starting at uh, Zuchi Systems, where uh, we'll be inviting founder CEOs and uh, talk to them about their entrepreneurial journey. Um, let me introduce our guests for today. Um, those of you in the audience who don't know Tamil, please bear with me for a brief moment uh, when I say this. In uh, Tamil, when uh, someone is doing exceptionally well in any arena of life, people say, oh, oh, no, as far as our guest is concerned, I'd love to slightly change it and say Zoho Nupandra. So uh, we have Sridhar Vembu, founder and CEO of Zoho with us today. Sridhar, Namaskaram and uh, welcome to Surarai Portal. I wish we can see you. Unfortunately, uh, the webcam doesn't seem to work for you for whatever reason. But welcome uh, Sridhar and uh, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Uh, Thank you. Our pleasure, Sridhar. Our pleasure. Um, so to those who are in the audience, um, uh, Sridhar Vembu needs no introduction uh, within the IT community in India and outside of it, actually. Uh, however, it would be my honor and privilege to introduce Sridhar to this uh, you know, audience today. Um, Sridhar was born in Umayalpuram, a small town in the Tanjavur district of Tamil Nadu. Sridhar did his uh, BTEC. Uh, from IIT Madras, specializing in uh, electrical engineering, and uh, went on to Princeton, USA, to uh, do his uh, PhD. Uh, Sridhar worked in Qualcomm for a couple of years uh, before he bootstrapped Advanet in 1996. Um, in 2009, Advanet became Zoho Corporation. Zoho, as uh, Sridhar recently mentioned in an interview, probably a year back or so, has more than 300,000 customers. And uh, as most of us in this audience know, uh, Zoho competes with uh, global names like Microsoft, Salesforce, Google, and everybody. So it was, it's, it's a pleasure inviting, uh, having Sridhar on our show. Uh, what do you want to hear from Sridhar today? I was thinking about it as I was preparing for this uh, meeting. Everything that we want to know about Sridhar is available in uh, either print content or, uh, you know, on the visual medium online, actually. Um, you know, in terms of how he boot, bootstrapped the challenges that uh, Advan faced during the dot-com burst, uh, Sridhar's vision for rural India, the reason, you know, Sridhar refuses venture capital, why he is not interested to know Zoho's valuation um, about Zoho University, the way they are shaping up people, uh, you know, Sridhar's philanthropy activities, and more recently about uh, Zoho setting up a 250-member uh, bed or a community hospital near Katangula to Chennai. So everything is available on the internet. So again, if you're following, following Sridhar on Twitter, you can know more about his thoughts on rural housing, Carnatic music, Tuklak magazine, his take on uh, doctorates, education, his love for Tamil language, everything actually. So it made me wonder, what should I uh, you know, request Sridhar to talk to um, you know, with this audience? What is that we would like to know from him? As we say, when you when you engage with people of Sridhar's stature, when you when you talk to them, there is so much of learning that we can get from him. So, I'm not going to deep dive into any of the topics that I just mentioned that is available publicly. But today, I want to ask a few questions to Sridhar, where we know more about uh, you know his uh, bootstrapping uh, journey, uh, skills for entrepreneurs, time management, and uh, his inspirations, and uh, you know many other interesting topics actually. We have a 45 minute session that would uh, end at uh, 10 15. Of course, if there are a few minutes uh, that we can extend and do that, uh, we'll try and see if you can accommodate that, if you can cover all of our questions. Um, you know, with that being said, Sridhar, I would like to start off with the first question to you by asking um, Do you remember the exact moment when uh, you know the thought uh, to start a company came to you or when you decided to start a company? Uh, when and where did it happen? And uh, did you have a business plan and all that ready when you launched? That that would be my first question uh, for our audience. Yeah, there was, uh, it was probably around seven, uh, 95, 96 when my brother and uh, myself, my brother Kumar, who is a co-founder, and I were uh, 
we were both engineers in Qualcomm in San Diego. And we would go, you know, when we go shopping weekend or something, we'll go to Walmart or we'll go to something and we'll see that there's pretty much nothing you can buy made in India, right? So, which told us, I mean, that is, then we realized, you know, we produce all the talent in India. There's so many of us here in the US, but why aren't we able to produce anything in India? So, and at that point, we knew that we want to be in business, doing something. But then he decided to actually go back to India around November of, of 1995. Then I left my job okay. in April of 96 and went back. There was no business plan, actually. Neither he nor I wow. had a business plan. And our plan was to do something. And we had saved up a little bit of money and that was going to be our, uh, we are wow. going to figure it out as we go. That was the plan. Wow. That was also why we never approached okay. the venture capital okay. or anybody, because we don't have a plan. What are they going to fund you on? So that is mm. why we decided not to. Yeah, know, okay. It's not like there was any choice in the matter. So at that time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Sridhar. But I Thank tried you. my hand in uh, some um, hardware. As in hardware. I tried my hand in building mm. some sort of hardware with an engineer, and that failed. And I spent uh, my savings at that point, and then I decided maybe we'll stick to software. So there was mm. well, along the way there was some uh, lessons learned like that too. So okay, okay, interesting, Sridhar, because uh, my my uh, succeeding following question was on that actually, because in one of the interviews you did mention that uh, you spent about uh, fifteen lakhs of your money with your uh, on your first product idea, which you had mentioned that uh, you know did not even take off beyond the drawing board. So yes. I wanted to ask you what lessons did you learn from that effort? Yeah, and uh, was the SNMP the second product that you tried uh, at that point of time? Yeah, so that actually it was a little bit longer route than that. When when the first product, the first idea, we had failed. Uh, then back to the drawing board, I had to actually also uh, I became a in Silicon Valley, you can find a lot of that bug fixing jobs easily. So, mm. because people need, typically what happens is you add engineering teams that maybe a startup gets sold, engineering engineers leave, bugs need to be fixed, they'll hire somebody. That's a very common mm. thing you see, actually. But particularly startups that get sold, mm. after six months, uh, somebody has to maintain that, right? So, there will be such mm. maintenance yeah. jobs available. So, I took up a job like that for a period to figure out what to do because that was an easier one to get an easier one to and they also have you know, they know that you'll fix a few bugs and then go so that was the idea they're not expecting any the already, company already met its objective of exit right <laughs> it's already exited yeah. successfully yeah. so at that point uh, nobody has really motivation to do anything new they just want to keep the system running so they'll call right like uh, somebody to do that maintenance and I was doing some of that for a period actually mm. just to then uh, one of our uh, common friends Tony Tony Thomas he actually had uh, that SNMP mm. PA that he built actually so it wasn't uh, I, I didn't build it he had built it and okay and he came and he asked for help he said uh, uh, I need help with marketing this so I said, okay, I'll mm -hmm. help you market. So, you know what, he's an engineer, I'm an engineer. He's asking for help. I said, I'll, I'll market it. <laughs> Not knowing what okay. that meant. So <laughs> then we go to a trade show and surprisingly we found some customers. So that was when it became kind of, okay, once you have customers, some customers are willing to pay for it. So it becomes real. So that is all okay. happened. We knew we wanted to be in business, but uh, it wasn't uh, a slow accidental process. Meanwhile, my brother Kumar had found some things in India to keep uh, himself busy. He had uh, he was building some okay. telecom protocols at the time, and he had uh, okay. some uh, uh, money coming in through that effort. 
so we were keeping okay. ourselves alive for the first uh, few months or a year trying to figure out what to do next mm -hmm. so that was the situation as of 96 97 so okay excellent and and you know naturally uh, th that's another thing that you have spoken about in all your interviews the first few years of uh, survival and uh, you always wanted to uh, yeah. make sure that you you know uh, yeah advent survives basically so how did you handle uh, how did you handle all the distraction at that point of time Shri? for example let's say um, i'm sure people would have come to you saying that you know this is not for you you know maybe you should think about doing other things and uh, you know maybe you should go for vc and things like that how did you keep that motivation going at that point of time so i basically i don't interact with uh, and even now, right? It's you choose your circle wisely. That's what I would say. Because it's, you know, okay. peer pressure is one of the reasons why we do a lot of things. So mm -hmm. I have always, whether in IIT or in uh, on business world, I generally kept a you know a peer group that is not very uh, you know. I actually never believe in chasing what is currently cool. I mean, you think about it, mm. in the, some of the greatest investors, like Warren Buffett uh, was a good example. He never chased what is cool. I mean, he sits in Omaha, Nebraska, right? I mean, Nebraska, Nebraska somewhere, Omaha, I think, right? right. Now, right. he's not in Wall Street. How many people think that uh, one of the greatest investors of all time will sit in Omaha, Nebraska, right? How many people actually True. True. realize that, that he could do that? And the reason why he said that is to insulate himself from the daily pressure of Wall Street, peer pressure, all that. So it's better for him not to be in the loop, actually, so to speak, often. So he'll make more objective Brilliant decisions. Point. And I am such a person, actually, it's better for me not to be in the loop. So I actually generally, mm. in other words, I don't crave to know the latest, what is, I'm missing out on something, the fear of missing out, right? I never had right. it, so we'll figure out something. That's what my and somebody will say, "Oh, you are going to miss the bus." Well, if you miss the bus, we'll catch the next bus. <laughs> There'll always be some bus, right? <laughs> so that's what they say. So, All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. But but um, uh, so so at that point, again, going back to the first question. So by the time you were into a few years, uh, you you were already into uh, business. Uh, you know, by a few years, uh, did you start actually putting together a plan in terms of what you wanted to do and things like that? Though you didn't have a business plan when you started. Actually, I don't know. We ever had a business plan. So that was a always. It was a. I mean, when you bootstrap, you have a discipline of you have to pay for yourself. Right? Every month, the rent has to be paid. Yes. The employees have to be paid, the electricity bill has to be paid, the phone bill has to be paid, all of that, right? So, you have that constraint. Yes. As long as you're meeting that, and you are going, and your revenue is coming in, and you can see some growth, we don't make very long-range plans that way, because they tend to, you know, if we have a, an approach to product, what we want to build, but we don't have an approach to okay. a, how that they should do the market because there's so many other variables that you don't get to control and you the market environments change all the time so we are we try not to project an illusion of certainty in those we try to control the variables we control mm -hmm. and see how to adapt to the market that's all i'll put it well, i'll give you an example Got we it. built a product let's say and the product doesn't have the market we think that it, or we thought it would have then we'll have to figure out how do we what do we do with this and of course mm. one option is yeah go do something else but there may be other options for example you repurpose it to some other adjacent market or mm. repurpose it to in uh, some other customer base you thought of right some other customers right. in a different right. way so right that you think of when you identify that okay the opportunity we thought was there isn't there kind of thing right so you are uh, yeah that is that is to me the equivalent of planning but it's planning with a, a different twist it, traditionally Got planning it. is thought to be you project a hockey stick or whatever growth smoothly ahead mm. everybody knows people who are doing it know it is fiction 
you really don't know that what is your growth going to be two years down the road anyway. Yeah. But you can say that this is the market we are going after. Maybe that market is uh, not the way we envisioned or not panning out. Then we shift it to some other market or some other kind of product okay. or, or something. You know, we can always figure out something. So. Yeah. So that that's bring, that brings up also another interesting question, right? Because it was the mid '90s when uh, uh, biggies like Infosys, TCS, Wipro were seeing success with outsourced software services, and you were right there in Silicon Valley watching all this and uh, you know seeing how these companies are doing, and a lot of entrepreneurs that are probably you know very well doing today in the services space started during at that point of time which is around 95 96 why did you choose to go the product route when you are you know right in front of your eyes looking at the auto services space and everything that's something i wanted to ask you yeah that was to me uh, even then it was kind of obvious to me that we wanted to build products because ultimately you know that if you want to build software and the margins will be better in the product than in services, right? That was obvious even then. When you, you just look at the revenue per employee of Microsoft versus Infosys, that will tell you mm. how much revenue per person they'll yes. make, right? So it was obvious. Yes. But it was obvious even in 95. But more than that, it was also that I temperamentally am not well suited for a, running a software services operation because you how to now you are you basically your product vision is not in your hand right you have to build a custom product for each customer or different one and so mm -hmm. that's a very uh, you know there is there's a lot of you you don't have a coherent what is your product so that is another uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing so you have to do what you like to do right that's another not just what business is you want to have some level of i'm able to do this business right so yes those were the reasons and finally it was also you know it was services was getting crowded already it's not like there were mm. not enough mm. players are, you know, there's already a lot of players even as of mid 90s in fact those same players are still there today it's not like very many new players yes right? so true it was already true. very crowded so it was not easy for a new entrant to break into so those were the reasons okay Thank you, Sridhar. So, again, you know, uh, a very uh, extended question to that. So, you started off uh, Advanet. Advanet was doing fine, and suddenly the dot com burst happens. In fact, I remember applying to Advanet for a job when you were in Velicheri. I believe you were personally part of interviews at the point of time, 99, 2000, actually. So, I, I, I remember the time when I came to the, um, you know, the office that was opposite to Velicheri bus stand. So, but anyway, getting back to the question. So, Advanet was doing well, and uh, you know, things were going fine, and then the dot com burst happened. And uh, you say that, uh, you know, you, you did mention in many interviews that. Uh, only three of your customers survived out of the 150 you had again a low point um how did you uh how, how was your mind you know working then what were you what was going on in your mind at that point of time what were you thinking about restructuring and all that yeah it was obvious that uh, the at that time 2001 after the september 11 attacks and then the 2002 it was obvious that the whole thing had gone and it was not going to come back okay it was a very the whole networking industry was going through a major shift consolidation mm -hmm. all that i mean you had uh, hundreds of optical networking startups and wireless startups right. all of those it was clear that they were going away and that's one of the things that people i mean don't learn these lessons from history today you see similarly uh, huge number of SaaS players. And it's not clear to me that mm. everyone can survive that day, right? It's, a, it's the same same forces. Mm. We have over capacity, they get consolidated. So, and that's what happened then. And so it was initially, it's, it's kind of, you know, depressing to realize that a lot of things you have worked on don't appear to matter because the market itself was going away. It's not our mm -hmm. fault, it's fault really. Market is going away, what do we do? So you have to, it was a period like, a, I would describe it like a funeral, funeral atmosphere. There's not, when you go into office was a pain. Right? Go to office and 
you're staring at the ceiling, you, know, you don't know what to do. But slowly you recover from it and you say, okay, we'll figure out something else. And I decided we have to do something else. We can't be doing this anymore. And it took a little bit of time to convince others that we ought to be doing something else. See, one of the things about a lot of good engineering teams is that you are, when you are on a path, you want to continue on it. To go and tell somebody, you know, scrap this code, we'll write some new code for a new business, is actually hard to do. They are mm -hmm. attached to the plan, right? But I have to persuade you yes. that because I have to say, you know, look, there's no market here. Market is vanished on us. It did vanish. Subsequent wow. the experience showed that uh, there never were that many optical networking players or any of that in the industry, ever again. So it vanished. So we have to do something. And, and uh, I had to restructure our teams to re-engineer the whole thing then build up new direction. That's what happened over 2003, four mm. Okay. And and uh, that, that again brings up another interesting point because you had uh, the, the foresight to see that this is going away. I need to think of something differently. So when it comes to decision-making, Sridhar, do you rely on data or your gut or what we call as intuition? And uh, how important is intuition for entrepreneurs? You need a mix of both, obviously. The data to make sure that you're not completely in your own imaginary world. But mm. you have to have some something prior to data because what data are you going to look at? That's a question, right? Mm. And, uh, and then what forecast would you do on the data that you will believe? I mean, you... For example, I'll, I'll tell you today's context. Mm. Do any of us know what is the post-pandemic shape of the economy, global economy, or US economy, or Europe economy will be like? What will it be like six months or one year from now? Can any of us predict? There'll be a lot no. of opinions. Each one, I can have an opinion, you can have an opinion, everybody will have something. But there isn't any yes. real great way to predict it. We look at the stock market, it's right. all time high. Right, but does it mean that yes, there's no disruption and it's a way to go? So, you cannot predict, yep, which means you have to go by something deeper than only data, you have to actually have something deeper. And, for example, in my case, I have actually believed for a while that the entire global trading system, economic system we are on, is an unsustainable course, so we have to change course. Mm -hmm. And that that has been my uh, thesis for a while. Okay, mm -hmm. so we try to act according to the thesis. That's where a lot of the rural initiatives to all of that comes in because it's once you are on a thesis, then you will act on. And this current data, everything back it up because if you believe the stock market, the world is all in great shape. Okay, but is it in yes. great shape? Do we believe that it's in great shape? That's a question, right? No. So. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's a mix of both that you need. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll 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 uh, you know ask you another question based on uh, again one of your interviews. Um, um, I watched the Sastra University convocation that you did in uh, 2017, where you. Uh, where, uh, you know, um, giving away the academic degrees and everything. One of the most important points that you touch based, uh, uh, actually two, uh, you spoke about time management and quality of thinking. You you told about why you should, uh, you know, uh, look at quality of thoughts and things like that. But my question is on time management. Um, over the past 24 years, Sridhar, you have seen a lot in terms of uh, having an office almost empty to having, you know, 5,000, 7,000 people working and all that. How do you plan your day? How does a typical day look for you? How do you prioritize and work as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I try not to. I, my main uh, thing is not to overstructure myself. Mm. A lot of the, uh, in my opinion at least, the... To me, a difficult life would be one that's highly structured, rigid life, where every day is you have a, every hour is booked for some activity or other. You have no um, unstructured time to think about it, and that's 
the reason is that structure is like a syllabus in school okay right and i like to say all the interesting questions in life or business are out of syllabus <laughs> and that's actually what happens right a lot of uh, right. i mean literally compared to the business we were in zoho is out of syllabus you don't realize nobody is asking us to build this product nobody is asking us to do these things that's mm. literally out of syllabus from what we were doing right so how do you do it why do you do it right there is not an internal or external constituency to build any other things we built right and that became big businesses later so that comes from the thinking a little bit out of syllabus i mean they'll say out of the box but i say out of syllabus because really it's outside of your structured way of thinking about the world only too much structure you clearly need some structure but i'm saying that we don't want to burden ourselves with too much structure you got a balance uh, so which means that my day i actually have a few hours of calls with the various teams and internal and but mm. typically they won't be very scheduled meetings many of them will be ad hoc okay uh, as needed happens somebody will ping me in chat and say you know we need to talk about this then i'll we'll have a call we'll have a video call or chat or whatever okay so those kinds of activities will go on quite a bit and then and then i keep myself about a few hours block of time to read or think or and be more unstructured uh roaming around i also write some code to amuse myself and, yeah. and myself correct so all those so i keep uh, try to keep enough time that way so okay yeah i i did see that uh, you mentioned about writing code even today and i was wondering with so many applications how do you even you know get to it and do that <laughs> okay um so if based on your experience either for the past 24 years of entrepreneurship if you were to give some takeaways let's say three to four key takeaways for entrepreneurs budding entrepreneurs what would you say sridhar yeah i i mean one thing that i would say is if you you have to ask yourself why are you getting into business and because it's cool mm -hmm. because it's what everybody is doing and otherwise i have a fear of missing out on the action so be careful because those are the often the bad reasons to get into something because if you are entering something because mm -hmm. it's already very hot it's probably already too hot and it's already very crowded it's very difficult for a new entrant to make a mark mm -hmm. often right right so right. here on the other hand you have, you believe you have a very unique idea that is better than anybody else obviously you should do yourself a favor and enter but a lot of times if you are going to do this because it's hot and i have a fear of missing out then there's a one thing i would like to caution against second is very often i mean in these things you are if you are a fledgling new business both from a customer and you are a fledgling new entrepreneur think about both meaning you don't have experience you don't have any thing to you proved already to people then you have to assume that it's going to be difficult to convince any big customer to make take a big bet on you sometimes you may be able to you may be a very good sales person to do that but often not not many people are actually not such good sales people so <clears throat> then going and saying trust me on something and write a big check it can succeed for a very few people who have that skill set to convince like that for most people it <clears throat> may not work so then you have to think about how do you ladder this how do you how do you reduce the problem to something smaller where a customer will trust you for something smaller <clears throat> that would be one so think in other words sequence your big ideas into sequence of smaller ideas that's what i'd say try to figure out a okay smaller ideas that lead to a big idea rather than one big idea at all in one step that would be often useful okay. okay so okay and then finally you know your people you are you don't assume that when you are nobody you are going to be able to attract you are not going to be able to attract the coolest people or the hardest people Mm. right 
So right. uh, don't assume that you're not going to be able to attract. So you have to then figure out how to get some talent, which often comes down to, you know, how much are you willing to do to them rather than how much do you expect them to do for you. Right. And you maybe mm-hmm. you can't afford money, but are you going to give them training? Are you going to give them a challenge that is interesting to them? All of that. So that is how I want I would think about this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, how has the startup world changed uh, from 96 to today? We, as you rightly said, you know, a lot of uh, us are getting into business for various reasons. As you said, some of us might think that it is very cool. Uh, you know, it's the thing to do and all that. While some of us might have a valid idea and things like that. And you, you shared your thoughts on that. But how has the startup world itself changed? Uh, where do you see this going? Yeah, definitely in India, startups have become way cooler now. So compared to say 15, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, startups are much cooler, right? And from the government, everybody knows the issues of so. So that's one um, uh, uh, important thing to you know. That's the difference, key difference now. Second is of course a lot more venture capital is available today. And at yes. that time, even in the Silicon Valley, it was difficult. Even in Silicon Valley, venture capital was mm-hmm. It's less available. India it was non-existent. Today you have essentially everywhere there's a lot of capital flowing around. So that is another uh, uh, thing that's different. But I want to also caution entrepreneurs. That doesn't make it easier to. It may make it easier to start, but it doesn't necessarily make it easier to succeed. Because if it's easy to start for you, it's easy to start for everyone. If you can use right. AWS to scale, everybody can use AWS to scale. So right. scaling itself is not your secret uh, magic ingredient differentiator anymore, right? So you have to think along mm-hmm. those lines. Yeah. So just because some things have become easy, doesn't mean that easy thing will give you a competitive advantage, actually, necessarily. So. Right. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I want to ask one of uh, the questions based on what you said earlier. Um, you spoke about planning your day, reading books and all that. Um, time and again, you have cited uh, George Orwell, Bertrand Russell, and uh, particularly Iron Brand as an important reason for you to start a business. Um, do you get time to read books these days? What are you reading now? And uh, recommend some books for us. Yeah. So... This is the, yeah, the these, these days I've been reading, um, the, there's a book called How Asia Works by Joe Studwell on how the Eastern Asian economies developed. Then I just recently got a book uh, called uh, Trade Wars or Class Wars that explains why there's all these trade wars going on, US and uh, okay. China and all of that. It's very clear there is something right. big force around here, right? Uh, so that is uh, another book I'm, because I try to understand what is happening with the global economy now, where it's heading. So those are the books I've been reading, and I read also books on architecture. For example, there's a in maybe a controversial opinion, but not very. Most of the architecture of the 20th century is sucky. All these cubic boxes, box and box and box, mm-hmm. uh, with a rectangular box or or a cubicle box or whatever, but no real aesthetic to it, right? And because the idea of building a beautiful building itself seems to have gone away, that you build functional ugly boxes, basically. Why did that happen? So I've been reading a book uh, called The Architectural Dystopia. Why did that happen? So that goes into it. So those are some of the things I've been reading. Okay, and and uh, uh, just to extend that, is that like you you look forward to a model like a Larry Packer model kind of a architecture? Is what would uh, work best? Is what you, you are uh, ideally trying to say? Actually, we had look. If you go anywhere, you look at the older buildings, the older village. Right. In other words, you go to a village, you can pretty much tell which buildings were built recently because they are the ones that look ugly. Okay. 
Yes. And it's not just a matter of taste. You know objectively. Objectively that this is an ugly one. It won't last. You know that it won't last. Nobody will miss it when it's gone. See, the beauty of a building is when it's gone, you miss it, right? And a lot of these ugly yes. buildings, nobody will miss them when they are gone. They are gone. So why did we do that? Why did we end up with that? And that is an interesting question, right? It turns out there was 100 years ago, 105 years ago in Germany, there was a movement to destroy actively all notion of aesthetic in architecture because that is considered a unnecessary luxury of capitalism or some such thing. That is beauty in some ways, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. should not end. So you got to be very, uh, uh, and this is not minimalism. Actually, it's worse than that. It is brutalism. They called it brutalism. Brutalism is one of the things where you have this uh, absolutely unadorned concrete monsters. And the Soviet Union picked it up. Then the same kind of trend arrived in the US and everywhere. We are actually living in the right. world, living in those buildings, by the way. A lot of us, unfortunately. So, and that, I mean, you, you can see that it's a century long trend. Now it's reversing. A lot of people like me are now reacting to this and say, I don't want to build anything ugly. In fact, one of the things when I hire an architect, mm. tell them is pretty much all of 20th century is off limits. If you are bringing a 20th century design, let's not have the conversation because mostly it sucks. Mm. Mostly it sucks. <laughs> so that is that is okay. what I say. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, apart from Zoho blog, Zoho website, uh, what other uh, you know top blogs, websites do you refer to? Something that you cannot live without, uh, you know, looking at every day, uh, where you gain a lot of inspiration from, or any any um, you know people, not people, but particularly content um, that you look up to every day. Apart from Zoho, yeah, I I look at Hacker News quite a bit, and uh, I spend some time going through some of the threads okay and uh, i actually have uh, browse some of the newspaper sites everything from uh, hindu or ndtv all that just to scan some news and new york times maybe bloomberg all that i just go through what is going on so just a okay. summary i don't read a lot of it because i don't have time but i just at least summary what's going on and but that's about it. I don't watch TV at all. I don't even have a TV set. So, okay, that's it. Yeah. Nice, nice. And and um, uh, who have been your biggest inspirations, uh, Sridhar, from uh, uh, you know since you were uh, young? Uh, I, I, do, I do remember that uh, you had mentioned about uh, Qualcomm co-founder and uh, one of uh, teachers from your school and all that actually. But I generally wanted to understand who have been your inspirations. Yeah, in the business world, once it got introduced, I actually was I used the Singapore founder Lee Kuan Yew as a big role model because ah, okay. he created from a third world country, racially, religiously, linguistically, ethnically, all manner of divisions. Any every possible way, it was a divided society. Right? And he made, forged the first yes. world nation order. From a third world uh, poverty, he raised it to first world yes. in about uh, 30, 40 years. That's so, very, yes, yes. you should yes. understand how he did it. I mean, these are extraordinary episodes in history. And yes. In my opinion, it doesn't get enough study. They should be studied and uh, uh, not like writing an exam study. Just actually read his books, read the stuff. I I bought all his collected works once when I was going through Singapore mm. and I went to the bookstore and bought all of Prime Minister Lee's collected works and I read them. I read them all probably in 94 and 95. Okay, so it made a lasting impression on me that how Prime Minister Lee thought about the problem, how he developed Singapore Excellent. right from uh, zero. Then another inspiration is I yes. look at the Honda yes. Motor Company, Honda Motor in uh, Japan. Japan. Mr. Honda was, uh, Honda Saichiro was a, from a humble origin, a rural, you know, he was a mechanic, to becoming a leading car maker in the world. How that 
process uh, that happened. So I have uh, written about that and I take some inspiration from it now. And you have to go through step by step. Onda began in the 1950s, but until the 19, late 70s, they were not a major player in the US at all. In fact, until maybe 80, so it took 25 years. Yes. And we don't, I mean, we don't think in those 25 years now. We think some magic should happen in three or five years. And it's, in my opinion, that's very hard to do. True, true. Thanks, Sridhar. I think we are almost, uh, you know, we have about, uh, yeah, we are almost towards uh, the end of this. Um, Sridhar, thank you so much again uh, for joining us and for sharing a lot of valuable thoughts. See, every time I, uh, I, I have friends who have worked from abundant period, so uh, I keep hearing about you since 98, 99. So every time I hear about you from my friends who have worked in Advent and Zoho from the past or any article that gets shared with me uh, on LinkedIn or any other social media, Sridhar, I always get reminded of uh, the famous lines of Avayar from uh, the Tamil Nidhi Nul called Muthurai. I'm sure you know it. Uh, again, once again, if the audience, uh, if you are not aware of Tamil, uh, my apologies for that. But uh, those four lines is what I feel personifies you actually. Um, so uh, which basically means uh, every even if there is a single good soul out there uh, that itself becomes the reason for rains to benefit everyone so that's what i always think about you when somebody brings up your name much, once again <laughs> thank you so much either yeah, <laughs> no no Thing. Sure, Shrita. Because I see the questions on the thing, and I so there was a question about the Japanese. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Shrita. I, I was watching. Yeah. Yes, Shrita. Uh, first question is. Question of um, Japanese. Yeah. Maybe I'll say that's in the bottom of that list. I yes. assume it's the top of uh, this thing. Okay. So I'll try to. Yes. So what I would say is, oh. uh, I mean, the Japanese professor said, challenges us why we are not making the mechanical pencil in India. The engineering drafting principles yes. we use. He said it's made in Germany. I mean, Indian engineers should be able to make it, right? That really made an impression. I mean, see, the Japanese think in any product. I mean, in fact, to this day, I follow this. When I see some new product, I ask, how is this made? Who makes them? What kind of machines would you use? What kind of technology is in it? Not that I'm going to make them, but at least I want to get that's my hobby. For example, I watched a video how the nail cutters are made, nail clippers are made. How do you make them? <laughs> so right. I would like to increase that kind of habit. Okay. So yes. Yeah. And and you said that uh, if I remember correctly, the Japanese actually made it right, though they were uh, a little disappointed initially that it was done by Germany. They said we will make it in Japan in a couple of years or a few years from now. Right? That's what I, I read about it when I saw the story, right? Yeah. So that is the that we have a lot to learn from Japan, actually, particularly in India. And uh, we mm. I don't think we pay enough attention to Japan. That's the we we pay a lot of attention to US, all that, but Japan is a good model because it's an overcrowded populated country, right, in a way. And now, of course, they, they have a population problem, but that's because they are highly dense. It's exceptionally dense, as dense as India, not more. So it's worth uh, paying attention to their experience. Sure, sure. So, yeah. Any other questions that uh, you want to pick up, please go ahead, see there. I'm yeah, also looking see, that uh, there are anything that you find interesting to answer. Somebody yeah. wanted us to go a meeting. Yeah, I, I would have liked to, but maybe from next meeting we are uh, we'll do this. And, uh, yeah, I'm I'm sorry about that uh, again to the audience. We could have had a webcam with three there. Unfortunately, I don't know what went wrong. Sorry about that. I have the webcam didn't work here on this. So some weird reason on the go to webinar. I tried very hard, but couldn't get it to work. Okay. And uh, we will do another session with you, yes. Sridhar, a little, a little later. Thank yeah. You. yeah, thank you. Thank you also. Yeah. Thank you, Sridhar. Thank you so much, Sridhar. Thank you for your time. Take care. Uh, wishing you and Zohar the best. Take care. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you for the audience. Thank you for the audience.
Thanks. Thanks to the audience. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.